What you see now, right, is you see kind of the sea of really interesting layer one blockchains, but they're not really kind of unified. And because of that, you don't really see the power of interoperability and shared security in actually producing really, really interesting applications. Swissborg. 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 Swissborg is sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the market. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fees. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no OBS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest. Dieter Fishbein, Web 3.0, Polkadot, Kasama Networks, everything you need to know when it comes to one of the hottest projects of 2021. And by the way, we had two other amazing guests, the lovely Irina Karagiaur, who came on the show. Don't forget to watch her episode, but also Joe Petrosky. So to, just to make sure that you guys have all the information you need in order to fully understand this project. And before we kick off, a big shout out to Nate at Crypto Slate, our partners for always writing great summaries of all these videos in case you want to read more. Definitely check them out. And now, Dieter. Thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today, buddy? Yeah, I'm doing really well. How are you, Alex? I'm really, really happy. It's been a long interview in the making. I know you were super, super busy, you know, biddling, as we say. Uh, but first and foremost, I have to ask you a really simple question. You work for a foundation called Web 3.0. Can you just educate us and for all the people watching out there, what exactly is Web 3.0? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question because I think everyone will have slightly different definitions of this. But for me, Web 3.0 comes down to the promise of technology to really give us new coordination tools. Um, you know, I think when you look at decentralized computing, like this really allows us to create uh, pieces of technology that fundamentally give people ways of coordinating that are, are very different than what we see today. And ultimately, this is going to be used so that we can solve large problems that require coordination amongst multiple stakeholders. And, and I think what you're actually going to see from this are you're going to see kind of these, these groups of people or these groups of users or entities that can coordinate in ways where they yield similar power to, to nation states today. Uh, you're going to see these groups enter into business transactions, own property, generate income on behalf of their users and stake stakeholders. And I think, you know, what kind of Web3 technologies bring us are kind of more transparent processes and kind of more democratic, nimble and powerful governance structures to enable this. You see the beginnings of this now, right? You see like the DAO model is very much, I think, where this starts. But I think like once you get more scalable platforms, once you get better on-chain governance, then this can evolve into something much, much bigger um, than just like on-chain groups deploying assets, but actually kind of these, these fundamentally new power structures. That makes a lot of sense. And you just brought up the DAO model. And to be honest, Dieter, like to me, the DAO model is the most powerful part of decentralized nature, the decentralized web, simply yeah. because, you know, when I think about it, we're taking away the power from these inclusive privileged you know, VC groups and early stage investors, giving it to everyone, uh, but also giving them the, the democratic, the governance side that you mentioned, you know, so all the way from actually seeding uh, a company all the way to even sharing the revenue through token models. Is the DAO model one of the most important aspects of the decentralized web? I think the DAO model, like rather than being 
one of the most important aspects. It is the beginning of what's going to be like really the power of decentralized computing. Um, you know, when, when you take the DAO model to extremes, again, you can get these kind of uh, different types of interactions where kind of users have much more control over kind of the, the actions of the group they're in and where they can be much more evenly incentivized, right? Like imagine a nation working as a DAO where basically everyone, and of course, like this, this requires a lot more than we have today in terms of tech, in terms of like ideas behind governance structures. But that's something where you could have a, really a lot more fairness and a lot more kind of even uh, distribution of power and wealth than I think what, what we can see today in, in these sort of structures. Yeah, it makes total sense. Really, that's exactly how I see it, where, you know, it used to look a little bit triangular, where people would only have impact on providing feedback for products and all the rest is closed, right? You have the investor level, you have the employee level, and then at the product mm -hmm. level, people can start getting engaged, right? But now it seems like from the investment level to the governance, to the, the benefits, like you said, the redistribution of the wealth, everything is completely open. And I, I, find, that, I find that absolutely fascinating. Yeah. And like I said, I think the DAO is just kind of like the first iteration of something like this. And, and you need much, much more to actually make that greater. Amazing. And of course, I would love to ask you many questions about Polkadot and Kusama. But before jumping into that, uh, I would love to ask you about DeFi in 2021. Obviously, like DeFi was the main topic in 2020. And 2021, yeah. it's still kind of the hottest topic at the moment, of course, with proof of stake blockchains and other things. But um, uh, where are we heading this year? Like in 2021, what are some exciting developments or what are some things that you really look forward to? Totally. So, I, I mean, I think DeFi is great, right? It's really interesting because it's the first example of actually blockchain technology being used, right? Um, the thing that always kind of makes me less excited is that when you look at what's happening with DeFi, all but for a few examples like automated market maker style DEXs or you know other things, these are essentially um, centralized finance type structures that we're just seeing on chain, right? And so what you, what you get are you basically get crypto native experts using kind of a decentralized version of centralized banking and finance infrastructure. And people make money, it's a bit of a casino, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's like actually adding that much value externally. Um, what I would like to see is much more innovation around DeFi uh, that makes it useful and appreciable for the average user that's not necessarily this crypto native expert, right? And so, I don't know if this is where DeFi is necessarily going more than where I would like to see it go, but something like a, a decentralized version of AngelList. I, I mean, this is kind of back to our conversation on the DAO model and, and kind of where I would like to see the Web3 space go. But I think having something like that where you have basically killer UI and where you know people can actually get a useful product out of it that um, you know, my mother could use, for example, who doesn't know anything about blockchain. That's, I think, where we should try to go. That's a really important aspect, actually. You mentioned that you know the automated market making, the farming and that stuff, and it's it has some centralized components. Is it really DeFi or not? Because one company is reaping the majority of the benefits and stuff like that. But how, you know, it's a really tough question, Dieter, but what can qualify something as DeFi? When you think about it, even decentralized exchanges you pay a commission to one company and that's not decentralized. So, uh, you know, I remember having Paolo Arduino, the CTO of Bitfinex on the show, and, and he was saying a decentralized exchange is not actually decentralized unless you had an actual trading engine for each person to trade completely openly without having someone who owns the infrastructure architecture. Um, it sounds a bit crazy and sorry for such a challenging question, but would love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, I guess my point was more that like, uh, like with an automated market, uh, automated market maker style DEX, like my point was less that this isn't totally decentralized, but more, I guess this is an example of an innovation where you see like a bit, a bit of a different uh, style of exchange than you see like mimicked in centralized financial infrastructure. So this is like a small innovation where kind of that, that 
that has been added to a, a decentralized piece of technology. But my overarching point is, other than like little things like this, you know, the stuff you can do on DeFi is very much what I can do in the real world, right? I can go out and I can loan, um, I, I, I can enter into loans or I, I can, um, you know, trade on, on something that's an exchange. Like fundamentally, I, I think blockchain technology can take us to very different places than we are today. And I don't see DeFi doing that is really my point. And this is where I think we should all try to take it. Yeah, that makes a lot, a lot of sense. And thank you so much. And by the way, guys, for you watching out there, if you do see a project that you really think is 100% DeFi, don't forget to let us know which project it is and why, of course. And uh, moving on to a very exciting topic, which is Polkadot and Kasama. Dieter, I think you're one of the best people on the planet to ask these questions to without putting too much pressure on you, by the way. <laughs> but uh, I would like to kick off with a very simple question. I remember having uh, Joe Petrosky, for those who haven't watched the interview, uh, Joe is a really intelligent person. He's also uh, deeply involved with Polkadot and Kusama. And I remember him telling me that the definition of Polkadot is kind of like the, the big brother and Kusama is kind of like that rebellious cousin rock star. But what, what is your definition of Polkadot and what is your definition of Kusama yeah. and how do you differentiate the two? It's, it's a great question. And, and thanks for asking that, because I, I think a lot of people struggle with this and, and probably a lot of your viewers as well. Uh, so the way I, I would start by defining Polkadot and, and what Polkadot is, is it's a layer zero meta protocol, which is designed to enable the secure interaction of layer one blockchains. In the Polkadot ecosystem, these are called parachains. So let me let me actually define a bit of what parachains are, and then I'll go into like what Kusama is relative to that. And so a parachain can really be any layer one blockchain. Um, so I, I mean, Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, you know, other layer one blockchains. Like the idea is that if you're building a parachain on Polkadot, uh, you can customize this and make it whatever you want it to be. And so when I think of like what, what do parachains actually look like in the wild, I, I think of them as, as living on a spectrum. On one side of the spectrum, you have application-specific parachains. So these are parachains that are designed to be applications for a single set of users. A, a good example of this is Laminar, which is a trading platform for synthetic assets. And a user could just be like you or me. I could go and I could use Laminar um, just, just normally, as, as I would any other similar application. On the other side of the spectrum, you have platforms. Um, so rather than like a direct user who wants to interact with an application, a platform for a platform, users are developers, and these are designed to be platforms where applications are deployed. Uh, you know, an example of one of these, I, I, like Ethereum, could very much, like a, an Ethereum style, like Ethereum could very is an example of one of these platforms. Though, though Ethereum is not a parachain, um, and so. When you think about what these platforms look like, I mean, there's a few examples building on, on Polkadot today, like Moonbeam, uh, Akala, Plasm, Edgeware. They will really have kind of their own mini ecosystems of applications built on their platforms. And when you think of what an application on Polkadot is, this is actually something that lives above these parachains and probably uses a bunch of them in different ways to actually produce a complete user-facing application. Um, does that make sense, Alex? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense so far. Great. I love it. So just to recap so far, layer zero, uh, you're talking about the infrastructure and layer one, you have these parachains that are customizable. I have a quick analogy that I'd love to share with you if you can approve sure. it or not, Dieter, is the way I kind of see it is like, Ethereum is more like a shared co-working space, right? Where everyone is in this space and they're sharing and gas fees and it's all together. While a parachain is more like having your own private office where you can hang whatever you want on the walls. You can set the rules that you want. Is that, is that a poor analogy or is it, I would love to, if you have any analogies, I'd love those. Yeah. Those. <laughs> I mean, I think the way I would think about it is like, you could build uh, a, an Ethereum-like parachain right? But you could never build like parachains on Ethereum. I, I, I don't know if, if that if that makes sense. Like a, a, like a parachain on Polkadot can really be a highly customized blockchain of, of any type. Whereas Ethereum kind of limits you to developing applications in a very prescribed environment. 
I don't know if that's helpful. Alex. No, it is super helpful. I, I think it's really, really cool. And and the whole idea is to own that chain. Is that the, the ownership and being able to customize it to a specific project's needs? Is that the like the value proposition versus building on Ethereum, for example? Yeah, I- exactly. So I, I guess the fundamental question, like why would you build a, a parent chain on Polkadot uh, rather than building on Ethereum? Uh, because Building on Ethereum, you're basically stuck kind of developing an application in this like environment designed for general computations, right? And so there's no ability to actually tailor this environment to to the use case that you're trying to accomplish. So for example, if I want to build a decentralized exchange, um, I think there's probably a way to do it where there's probably a few dozen types of transactions um, that actually you need to, that the decentralized exchange needs to understand. It doesn't need the power of a full Turing complete smart contract platform like Ethereum is. And so by kind of tailoring your environment to just handle these types of specific transactions, you can actually just like cut out a lot of like slack that would normally be there because you're really not using the power of a completely generalized platform and come up with something simpler, more secure, faster than you could otherwise build out of Ethereum. That makes a lot of sense. So another analogy, sorry, I'm going to try. Yeah. No, no, what no, about keep if, going. If like you know, using Ethereum, you're on this highway, right? That's crowded with different, uh, there's traffic with different cars and, you know, different yeah. users, a truck to a motorcycle, and then a parachain was like your own private road that goes to destination A and B. Is that better? a better analogy than the the private uh, private office versus the, the co-working space? Yeah, I mean, you touch on another point. Like if you're building a parachain on, on Polkadot, I mean, by kind of contributing a, a dot bond, um, which, I mean, we can talk about the parachain auction process a bit later, but then you, you basically have uh, like guaranteed transaction throughput through the relay chain. And so th- this means that, you know, you're, you're never kind of competing to get your transactions uh, into blocks with, with other parachains, basically. And so you're never going to kind of run into these same type of congestion issues that, that you're seeing on Ethereum today. That's super cool. Super well said. And also in terms of Kusama, like I know in the beginning, it was kind of like the test net and uh, a bit of a, I guess, um, a way to mitigate risk for Polkadot, but now it's becoming something cool. You know, it has that fearless, you know, rock star type branding. Has 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 the original like um, idea of Kusama changed over time as there's more adoption being or more projects wanting to build on Kusama? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I could just maybe back up and, and tell the story of, of Kusama. Um, so I think this was this was August uh, 2019 or so, and, and Polkadot was was actually largely done then. I think we were about uh, 80% there in terms of building the code base. And at the time, there was a lot of crypto economic questions that still remained that we, we really wanted to test out. But in order to actually test crypto economic security guarantees, it's really difficult to do this with, with a valueless network. Right, because people naturally will not behave the same way in, in, when, when there's nothing at stake, basically. So it was decided that, that the foundation would launch Kusama, which was basically like an early version of Polkadot, N- not a testnet. Um, always the intention was that Kusama would live in perpetuity. And, and I'll, I'll get into why that makes sense later, but basically launch this early version of Polkadot test out um, you know, some of these crypto economic uh, incentive mechanisms and, and also um, allow us to really kind of run something in the wild and see how it behaved. So this was launched and it did allow us to basically launch a network before launching Polkadot, which was good training and, and kind of we, we learned uh, a lot of things about the tech and a lot of things about the community, which was really interesting. And now that you basically have these two networks living side by side, the intention is that Kusama has, has a few different um, use cases, I guess. Uh, one use case, of course, is, is to harden Polkadot. So, you know, when we're introducing new technologies to Polkadot, invariably they will be launched on Kusama first, 
at least, I, I mean, ultimately this is up to governance, but this is the intention, at least for the short and medium term, um, to basically see how they behave in a live network um, before kind of going onto Polkadot, which, uh, you know, is by intention more robust and, and more secure. And so this is one use case. But then a second use case, uh, which I think is a natural extension of this, is that if you're a project and you're planning to deploy a parachain to Polkadot, then it may make sense for you to deploy a parachain to Kusama as well. And you can ask, like, why? Why does this make sense? Absolutely, yeah. And the answer is really the same way it makes sense for Polkadot to test experimental features on Kusama before bringing them to Polkadot. Uh, a parachain running a business could test these features on Kus their Kusama implementation and, and see if they made sense to actually deploy to Polkadot. Uh, before doing that. And, and this could allow a couple of different things. Like one, you know, if they need to test crypto economic incentives in their protocol, obviously this makes sense. Two, if they're trying to develop a product and they actually want to see how it's going to be used in conjunction with other products, but they're not actually really ready to deploy this to their mainnet, then Maybe let's try it on Kusama, which, wow, this is still a live network. This still has real users, but we can be a little edgier. We can be a little more experimental because this is not our main blue chip deployment. And then the third reason is you can think of Kusama as being very similar to Polkadot in the sense that it's largely the same tech, except maybe like a slightly more experimental version of Polkadot. Um, and it, you know, it, it's also, it differs because it's slightly less secure, and this is largely because of economic security, uh, and it's slightly less robust because we're always deploying experimental features to Kusama before Polkadot. And so when you step back and look at like the difference between these two Bs is Kusama is a more experimental, slightly more advanced, uh, slightly less secure and less robust version of Polkadot. Although it, it, it's still, you know, compared to most layer one networks, I would say it's, it's extremely, the, the economic security guarantees are very high. And so when you think about like why a project would, would deploy to Kusama, it, it comes down to this, it comes down to because it has lower economic barriers of entry than Polkadot. And so if you're like, uh, you, you know, and Polkadot's gonna always be, the chain that's 100% focused on security and robustness. So if you're an earlier stage product project, um, and say you're not doing anything that's like hu hugely like high value transactions, then maybe you want to trade off um, trade off you know a small amount of security and robustness um, for kind of deploying to this network with lower economic barriers of entry, basically. And so what you see is you see Kusama becoming this, you know, faster moving environment for earlier stage teams that are less willing um, to pay the, you know, the higher cost to deploying on Polkadot uh, and would rather kind of deploy in an environment where they can really like perfect their product, their use case, build their community of users. And, and Polkadot ultimately presents a potential upgrade path. Um, for if they actually kind of achieve critical mass. If I understand correctly, the smaller, earlier stage project, projects that maybe they, they have less funds to deploy, they, they may go on Kusama they, and, and perhaps even stay on Kusama if they're happy with the network. But eventually, if they for grow sure. big and, and they're generating the right revenue and they feel that they're ready for a, a bigger, more secure, more robust platform, then they transition to Polkadot. Is that more or less the, the summary? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And I think the other part of it is you can look at this um, based on verticals as well. So I think like a lot of DeFi applications, especially the ones that use high value transactions, are going to kind of greatly, greatly um, value um, the security and robustness that Polkadot can provide. And, and, you know, I think probably for applications like that, like Polkadot's always the platform of choice. But say if you're like, you know, a, a social networking plat or platform or application or something that deals with kind of lower value content distribution or even micropayments, then you can, it, it's great, it, it's easier for you to justify a Kusama deployment because there's, there's just less that can go wrong. 
and and, and so it's stage, it's vertical. It, yeah, I think it's both of those things. I remember I have actually Irina Caragua, one of the Polkadot ambassadors on the show as well. She was super cool. And if I recall, it was between 1,000 to 3,000 transactions per second per parachain. Is that, is that more, are those the, the current figures as well? I mean, that was back in the day, it was last year, last summer. Uh, have the numbers changed? Are there any cool numbers that you can share uh, in, with regards to Polkadot or Kusama? Yeah, I, I believe that's the, the current estimate of, of you know transaction speed for parachains. I mean, I, I think transactions per second is is a tricky one, right? Because it really depends on the transaction. But uh, I mean, if you actually achieve that on one parachain, then and, and this is a very you know conservative number, but we, we don't you know we'd rather kind of promise less and then actually deliver more. Um, but when you achieve that on one parachain, because this is basically a, a system of what's going to be likely about 100 parachains after two years, uh, you know, that's that's 3,000 time, times 100. That's a fantastic kind of amount of throughput. And so if somebody wants to actually build on Kusama or Polkadot, like how many tokens would it require? What are some of the requirements? Because I'm sure there are also some blockchain projects watching out there, right? So could you tell us a little bit more about the hows and how to get involved? That'd be great. Sure. So let me kind of back up a little bit and tell you where Polkadot and Kusama are now. So, so basically, both these networks are launched, um, they exist, they're being used, but really all you can do on these networks are you, you can stake DOT or you can stake KSM and you can kind of transfer DOT between accounts. The next big stage and, and obviously kind of the most critical stage in a lot of ways is to like enable parachains. And so, you know, there's this giant community basically of well over 100 teams that want to actually take the layer one blockchain they've been building and deploy it onto Kusama or Polkadot. But where we're lacking right now is actually the technology to allow this. And so uh, this is kind of the next big thing. It's, it's not going to be a long time where, where um, un until this happens, but this is where we're at. And I, I think that's important context. And where what's going to happen is after after we're satisfied that the technology is ready for parachains to be added um you know there's going to be kind of like a series of steps but then at some point we're going to start uh public parachain auctions on both kusama and polka dot and and basically what these will look like is there will be um for, for each of the slots well, for on Polkadot, you'll basically start with an auction that will last a finite period of time in which any project that is interested in actually leasing that slot, so, so we call it leasing because they're, they're only available for up to two years, can enter a bid in, in terms of DOT. And so the plan is once we start parachain auctions on, on Polkadot, um, there's going to be a period of time for the first auction. When that's over, that slot will be assigned. We'll immediately start the second auction, uh, and this will essentially go in, in perpetuity. And so, you know, very roundabout way of answering your question, but it's impossible for us to say what the number of dot um, is that will be required to actually actually attain a parachain slot, just because this is up to uh, this is up to the project. Very interesting. Yeah. So it has a very strong economic model on top of the robustness, security, um, the scalability, interoperability that you guys are aiming to achieve. And what if like uh, in a good scenario, I guess it's more of a positive scenario than a, than a negative scenario. What if out of the one million dot tokens you guys have so you're so oversubscribed that, you know, you want to hit those 100 parachains, let's say in this year. Um, and there, there, there's not enough tokens uh, in the actual terms of circulating supply. Could that scenario happen, or, or what would what would that type of scenario look like? Well, I don't think that actually could happen because for projects to actually bid, they need to have the tokens. Yeah, I think you would just see probably the cost of parachain slots go down, or the that is, I, I think you would actually see the amount of dot required. Uh, to win a parachute slot auction go down. Okay, so the, the, there would be adjustments for other people to be able to to actually well, get their own parachain as well. Well, it's all market based, right? So I mean, like if all the dot is bonded and all the rest is staked, then no one has dot to bid. But that's just not realistic, right? People, uh, 
and, and people can always unbond their dot. That makes sense. So th that really brings me to uh, another question, which I think is probably the question that everyone is asking themselves at the point when it comes to blockchains is, you know, this parachain concept is so cool and, and I can see so many companies wanting to use this and adopt it. Is this a threat to Ethereum or other blockchains? Obviously, you guys always communicated a message where you're here to help and to support Ethereum. But what if Ethereum does not deliver, you know, in 2021 uh, and things are postponed? Like in the worst case scenario, will Polkadot be able to facilitate the adoption or projects wanting to migrate, for example? Yeah, look, I, I mean, Ethereum has this, this massive community of great projects. And as you said, like our our mantra has always been like we, we really emphasize decentralized bridging between Polkadot and Ethereum. Uh, we we, you know, are are doing a lot so that applications built on Polkadot can actually easily access the Ethereum ecosystem, not only in terms of token transfers, but in terms of actually like you can have, you'll, you'll be able to have, um, you know, at some point applications on Ethereum actually interacting with applications on Polkadot, which I think will be super cool. So, uh, you know, by no means do we seek to replace Ethereum. We, we want to work with Ethereum and really leverage their amazing ecosystem. Um, there are a, a number of projects building on Polkadot where that can kind of handle a solidity based applications. Um, Moonbeam is one, uh, Akala is one, Edgeware is one. They're, they're all building infrastructure um, where you could take an application built on Ethereum and, and kind of deploy it directly on Polkadot with, with minimal changes. So, I mean, that's super exciting, but. Um, you know, it just gives kind of application developers more options. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's a, that's a great, great answer. Are there any particular like milestones or within the roadmap of both Polkadot and Kusama this year or for next year? What excites you the most, Dieter? I mean, obviously you must be excited just by this space in general at the moment, which is exploding from all angles yeah. and super exciting really from, uh, from everything, you know, compared to 2017, where it's mostly just ideas. So much thing is being built, so many things are being built, but what are you the most excited about when it comes to the roadmap, the Polkadot roadmap and the Xama roadmap? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Parachains, like, I think are the answer to that because what we've seen, right, is like people have been able to build uh, blockchains that will be compatible with Polkadot for, for a really long time, like well over a year, uh, I think almost two years at this point. So when you look at the Polkadot ecosystem, you see like it's over 300 projects that are, are doing something. And, and like I said before, like almost 100 projects that want to take this chain that they've been working on and connect to Polkadot. And so what, what you see now, right, is you see kind of the sea of really interesting layer one blockchains, but they're not really kind of unified um, under Polkadot. And because of that, you don't really see the power of interoperability and shared security in actually producing really, really interesting applications. And so, you know, parachains, like the addition of parachains, the start of parachain auctions, and actually when we see the first, I, I mean, when we see the first parachain even just join Polkadot, like this, these are all kind of the major milestones. And like, I, I think, in a year or like, you know, hopefully, hopefully potentially sooner, we're really going to start seeing the number of parachains on Polkadot hit critical mass and actually seeing this, this ecosystem of multiple layer one blockchains actually creating something, I think, far more interesting uh, than we've seen in the blockchain space before. And so, so this is really what excites me. And, and I think we're almost there. We're right on the cusp of that. That just really gives me an idea of what are the type of applications you're the most excited about this year? Obviously, there are many crypto trends. I guess the, the DEX was one of the big topics in 2020. But uh, what are you really excited about when it comes to the general idea of crypto projects building this year? It doesn't have to be re related to Polkadot or Kusama, but in general. And one of the really interesting aspects of Polkadot is the really sophisticated on-chain governance that exists. Like, I, as, as I think you probably know, Alex, and, and maybe some of your viewers know, 
Um, Polkadot is a super sophisticated on-chain governance system, which, which allows um, which allows like the protocol itself to be upgraded based on kind of on-chain votes, and it allows all, all sorts of other things, right? And I think because of the modular nature of what we're building, if you build a layer, like if you build a parachain, you can basically use this system of on-chain governance for your parachain as well, and so. I'm hoping what this leads to, and, and I'm seeing some examples of projects already building on Polkadot that are going this direction, is again, these interesting social models where, again, you'll start to see really the beginning of this, this Web3 vision of us kind of interacting in a much more interesting and, and valuable way. So again, like kind of the DAO taken one step further, basically. You know, I'm I'm with you, Dieter, 100% when it comes to the DAO. Like for me, that's that's really where I feel like we can absolutely change the way society is done today. You know, you can participate in a in a company or corporation from any level, from entry to to product creation. So um, I'm really looking forward to that open company model. I think one more that I find really interesting, but but for different reasons, are are NFT projects. Um, we're seeing NFTs being used in like art. Uh, gaming, loyalty programs. And it's nice because, again, this gives kind of ownership of these, um, these different types of objects back to the user. But I think almost nicer, I think this is really an area where you could actually see like the first blockchain use cases having widespread adoption by more mainstream communities. Um, I, I honestly, like, I think NFTs could be something, could definitely be something um, that stay long term and, and that become like a really ingrained part of what we're doing. But I also think that even if they don't, they have a really high potential to get a lot more people interested in blockchain tech. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, NFTs, I was just at a conference today at Dubai. DeFi Congress, and they were actually talking about how NFTs are still in very in the very early stages. Yeah, there's so much potential there to provide unique concepts. Um, and I must I have to ask you actually this this leads me to sort of the news of today since we're talking about what we saw at the conference today, uh, or more of the news of yesterday and the day before yesterday, which is uh, BTC. Obviously, you know, like uh, there's a lot a lot of hype around Bitcoin these days. So much that probably the most intelligent man of the 21st century has decided to put $1.5 billion <laughs> of his corporate treasury into Bitcoin. Uh, how excited are you these days um, with regards to Bitcoin? And at the same time, I'd love to ask you, I mean, everyone's like, yeah, more institutional adoption. But does that scare you as well? I mean, they're both pros and cons, right? Because the more institutions, you know, actually get Bitcoin, the less it's available to the mass or to the, the average Joe like, like myself. Or, or, or like like ourselves. And I would love to ask you, like, how are you seeing this institutional adoption? Because that seems really to be like the, the massive headline in the news these days. For sure, right? I think like every day in the past few weeks, I, I think I heard about a different institution that was buying Bitcoin. Um, look, I, I think I think this is interesting, right? Like, I think you could split this up into two different areas. You see some like large asset owners, like insurance companies um, and, and like endowments that are like putting a tiny piece of their very diversified holdings into Bitcoin because they're like, yeah, I mean, this, this could be a new asset class. Let's make sure we have exposure so that uh, our kind of stakeholders aren't like aren't beat out by inflation, basically. It's just a financial decision. And then you're seeing some corporations, I, I think, acquire Bitcoin as, uh, who knows, I think to some extent, it, it's, it's a bit of a gimmick to, to generate excitement about how innovative they are, right? When, it, when in fact, I, I think like acquiring an asset or acquiring a, a token is, is just really not that innovative. Um, it's interesting to hear and like, of course, it's fun to see the hype, but I would not place this in the same category as our vision for Web3. Um, it would be far more interesting if these institutions were actually, you know, committing to using blockchain tech or really exploring using blockchain tech. Uh, and this would be much more consistent with the goals of what we're trying to accomplish. What I'm hoping is that the trend towards more scalable platforms, kind of better governance, um, will ultimately 
be what actually incentivizes these institutions to come in and build high quality value add products using this tech. That makes a lot, a lot of sense. And let's hope we can go towards that bright future of ours and things are, are really starting to, to play out for the crypto space, as you said, and hopefully the institutions will really realize that this is more than just Bitcoin, Ethereum. This is much more than that. And, and uh, we're solving a lot of problems and with different projects that, that perhaps Bitcoin, Ethereum could not solve. So, well, thank you so much guys for watching. If you like this show, don't forget to like, comment and blast that bell notification so you can get access to more timeless interviews. Today we had Dieter Fishbein from Web 3.0, Polkadot Kasama. We'll put the Twitter feed below. Don't forget to follow him and follow Polkadot and Kasama for all the amazing upgrades and updates and milestones that are coming this year. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Thank you so much, Dieter, by the way, for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks so much, Alex. Really great to be here. Really great to have you. And don't forget to join us every Wednesday premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. See you next week, guys.